In this video, we're going to start looking at predicting reactions. So this is the unit that you've been waiting for. Let's start by looking at what a reaction looks like when we write it and talk about some of the terminology. So you can see that this is a reaction. You've probably seen something like this before in your classroom. But when you're looking at it, the items on the left, sodium and water, are the reactants. The reactants are the things that you start with to start the reaction, the things that you put together into the reaction. And then sodium hydroxide and hydrogen are the products, the products being whatever is created by the reaction. So everything to the left of the arrow is a reactant. Everything to the right of the arrow is a product. Let's talk about these little symbols that we have on the reactants and products. So you can see an S, so think about what that might mean. Maybe you guessed that it meant solid. The little L looks like liquid. That does not describe a solution. Then there's a G for gas. And AQ is for an aqueous solution, so anything that's dissolved in water. The next thing we need to talk about are some other symbols. They are not always in every reaction, but sometimes you'll see a, a Greek letter delta, which looks like a little triangle over the reaction arrow. And what that means is that we are continually adding heat in order to make the reaction occur. So when you're heating something on a hot plate or a Bunsen burner, that would be the time that you would use that delta. The other thing that you might see is a chemical formula over the reaction arrow. And in this example, you can see that there's Fe, which is iron. That's a catalyst. A catalyst is something that participates in the reaction but is not consumed, and it speeds up the reaction, and we'll see how that works uh, during the reactions lab. In this example, iron is our catalyst. Let's go back to those diatomic molecules. I know we have talked about this at this point, but you want to just remind yourself You want to just remind yourself what they are. Remember that some elements, when they are by themselves, not in a compound, they always exist in their diatomic form, and that is bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. Brinkelhoff. And that's just our little mnemonic to remember. Anytime we're talking about one of those chemicals in its natural state, one of those elements, we're talking about the diatomic molecule. So if something reacts with oxygen, you would always write O2 or nitrogen N2, that sort of thing. And remember the little patterns that I showed you on the periodic table. It starts with number seven and it's in the shape of a seven, except for hydrogen, which is always its own little animal. All right, let's talk about the types of reactions. There are several. The first one is when we put two elements together and they form a compound. That's called synthesis. So we're making something new out of two separate elements. The next one is when we take a compound and break it down into its elements. And that's called decomposition. And that makes sense if you've heard that term before. It's just a breaking down. The next one, if you look, A is with B in a compound, but then it switches places B and uh, C switch places, and this is called a single replacement. So C has taken the place of B with A in the compound. And then the next type, you can see that it's AB plus CD, and then B and C switch places with each other. That's called a double replacement. And then the last one, I know this looks kind of crazy, what you need to understand is that CXHYOZ is any carbon hydrogen or carbon hydrogen and oxygen compound plus oxygen gives you CO2 and water and that's a combustion reaction. So I'm going to let you look at some practice slides and we'll go over these in class tomorrow. I want you to see if you can tell which type of reaction each of one of these is. Pause the video, try to predict, and we'll go over these in class. All right, so let's take a look at this reaction. See if you notice anything unusual about it. Hopefully you're saying, wait a minute, there are two oxygens on the left, but only one on the right. And that's a problem because that second oxygen atom can't disappear. 
the law of conservation of mass or matter says that we just can't poof things out of existence. So they have to, uh, they have to go from one side of the reaction to the other. And so when we say that you must have the same number of atoms of each type, hydrogen and oxygen, on both sides of the reaction, and we call that balancing the reaction. And you may have done this in some of your other science classes earlier. The law of conservation of mass, we have to have that same number of each atom on each side of an equation, it means matter cannot be created or destroyed. It's here, it can transfer from one thing to another, but it can't just disappear. So in order to balance a reaction, we can change or add coefficients, the numbers in front, to the compounds. Do not ever add a coefficient to one element in a compound. It has to go for the whole compound. And we can never add or change a subscript because that changes chemically what it is. So it's no longer the same thing. I want you to think about the order of balancing things. This does not always work, but most of the time you'll find it useful. So if you have a uh, reaction where you have polyatomic ions and they're the same on both sides of the reaction, so you have nitrate on one side, nitrate on the other, it hasn't broken up into some other combination of nitrogen and oxygen, balance the polyatomic ions first. Then usually it makes sense to balance the metals, then the nonmetals, and you want to leave hydrogen and then oxygen for last. And that's partly because they're diatomic, so it helps uh, to leave those to the end to try to balance them. Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is how to balance reactions. So let's practice on the reaction that we started with. H2 plus O2 gives us H2O. And the way that I suggest you start these is by listing all of the elements that you have. I usually list them under the arrow, and I usually go left to right. So hydrogen and then oxygen, so all the elements in the reaction. And then you want to list how many of each atom you have. So on the left, I have two hydrogens and two oxygens. On the right, I have two hydrogens and one oxygen. That way you can see right away what's out of balance, and then this allows you to do some back and forth figuring out how to fix it. So if we know we need two oxygens, remember that we can only change the coefficient. We can't go in and add a subscript here. So we're going to put a two in front of the water. So that gives us two oxygens, but it also multiplies the two on the hydrogen. So now we have four hydrogens. So we need to go back and fix our hydrogens on the left. So if we put a two here, that gives us four hydrogens. So now we have four uh, hydrogens on both sides and four oxygens on both sides. And so that's a balanced reaction. Let's try another one. So with this one, again, we're just going to go ahead and list what we have. So we've got carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. We've got three carbons on the left, eight hydrogens, and two oxygens. Go ahead and see if you can figure out what's on the right. Pause and do that, and then come back and check. So you can see that you have one carbon, two hydrogens, and three oxygens. So this one, you can tell everything's out of balance. There, It looks like a little bit of a mess. So remember the order that usually works. So remember that we're going to save hydrogen and oxygen for last. So let's do carbon first. So in order to balance carbon, we need to put a 3 here. And so that gives us 3 carbons. Then we have 6 oxygens. Don't forget this one over here. So that gives us a total of 7. And then we need to balance our hydrogen. We've got eight on this side and two on this side. So if we put a four here, that gives us a total of eight hydrogens. And then this gives us now three times two is six oxygens, plus four times one is four. So that gives us a total of 10 oxygens. And you can see carbon and hydrogen are balanced. All we need to do here is put a five in front of the O2 and that will give us a total of 10 atoms of oxygen. All right, let's try another one. So remember to list the elements. I just list them in order from left to right. So we've got Fe, Cl, 
Na and S. Go ahead and pause the video, count up the atoms on both sides of the equations, and then come on both sides of the equation, and then come back and check and make sure you got it correct. So I got one Fe, three Cl's, two Na's, and one S. And then on the right, I've got two Fe's, one Cl, one Na, and three S's. So again, everything's out of balance. So remember that typically what we want to do is balance metals before nonmetals. So let's go ahead and start with iron. So we've got one on the left and two on the right. So if we put a two here, that's going to give us two irons. And then it's going to give us six chlorines. Now let's go ahead and balance the chlorine because we've got the six here. Uh, if we put a six here, that gives us six chlorines and also six sodiums. And then if we balance the sodium here, we've got a two. So if we put a three here, that gives us six sodiums and then three sulfurs. So that works the sulfur out on its own. All right. So let's try another one. Okay, so this one has those crazy polyatomic ions. So when you look at this, it looks like it's going to be a big mess. But remember, polyatomic ions, if they stay the same, so NO3 on this side, NO3 on this side, PO4 on this side, PO4 on this side, then we are okay to just list those as the polyatomic ions rather than splitting them into their elements because you can see with all that oxygen that would be a big mess. So I've got calcium. NO3, sodium, and PO4. So I'm going to go through and count. I've got one calcium, two nitrates, so that comes from that subscript. I've got three sodiums and one PO4. On the right, I've got three calciums. I've got one nitrate, one sodium, and then I've got two PO4s. So we want to go ahead and deal with the polyatomic ions in this one. If we go ahead and do the nitrate, we can put a 2 here in front of the sodium. And that's going to give me two nitrates and two sodiums. Now, our sodium is still out of balance, so we're going to have to figure that out. Let's look at our other polyatomic ion. Here I've got two phosphates on the right and one on the left. So I'm going to end up putting a two here. And so that gives me two phosphates and now six sodiums. So I'm going to have to come back and fix this problem with the, with the sodium. So this is no longer going to be a two. I'm going to have to put a six here. So that gives me six sodiums and six nitrates. And then I need to deal with the, the nitrate on this side. I've got two nitrates, so if I put a three in front of the calcium, that gives me three calciums and six nitrates. And you should find that you can balance it in two or three steps like this, even if it looks kind of complicated. There are some that may take one or two more, but if you find yourself going back and forth, Go back and double check to make sure you counted everything correctly at the beginning. And if you're still stumped, shoot me an email or ask me a question about it in class. All right, let's try another one. All right, so this one doesn't look too bad, but it actually can be a little bit tricky. So let's go ahead and list out the elements and count them up. So I've got one sodium, two hydrogens, one oxygen. On the right, I've got one sodium. Hopefully you see that there are three hydrogens and one oxygen. So everything is balanced except for hydrogen. So what you have to think about here, any coefficient I put in front of this water is going to give me an even number because the hydrogen has a two subscript. So I'm going to need to have an even number of hydrogens on the right. Any number I multiply H2 by is also going to give me an even number, but this one hydrogen is always going to make 
the total number odd. So let's put a 2 here. This is when the rules don't necessarily apply. So that's just the, the order of balancing is really just kind of a guideline. So let's look at that. So that gives us two sodiums, two oxygens, and four hydrogens. And hopefully you can see that we can go ahead and put a 2 in front of the H2O, and that balances the hydrogens and gives us four, and the oxygens giving us two, and then we can put a 2 in front of the Na and that gives us two sodiums on both sides, okay? So that one's a little trickier. Let's look at one more. Okay, so this is another one that's got just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Hopefully you recognize that this is a combustion reaction. Remember, a hydrocarbon plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide and water. So we've got two carbons. We've got six hydrogens and two oxygens. On the right, we have one carbon, two hydrogens, and three oxygens. So let's go ahead. Remember, we're going to leave hydrogen and oxygen for last. So let's start with carbon. I'm going to put a 2 here. That gives me 2 carbons. 2 times 2 is 4 oxygens plus 1, so a total of 5. Then we need to deal with these hydrogens. I've got 6 on the left side, 3 on the right, sorry, 2 on the right, and we're going to put a 3 here so that we end up with 6 hydrogens. So now carbon and hydrogens are balanced. Now we need to total up our oxygens. We've got 4 in the CO2 plus three, so now we have seven. So this is kind of the same situation that we were in uh, back with the other combustion reaction. The carbon and hydrogens are balanced, the oxygen is not. The problem is this time we don't have an even number of oxygen atoms, so we can't just put a coefficient, a whole number coefficient here. So the best thing to do in this situation if you are, everything else is balanced, the carbon and the hydrogen, and you have an odd number of oxygens, is to take that number and put it over 2. Because you can see if you have O2 and that multiplied by 7 halves, you would end up with a coefficient of 7. Now, the only thing that would be a problem is that if you had to give your answer with a whole number coefficient, and sometimes I will ask you for that, and on the common exam you are likely to see that. So if we want to get rid of that fraction, we're going to multiply all of our coefficients through by 2. So it would be 2, since this would be a 1 here. This coefficient would be a 7. This would be a 4. And this would be a 6. So it would be 2, 7, 4, and 6 to give the whole number coefficients. That one's a little tricky. We'll go over another one in class just to make sure everybody's got it. So if you have questions, shoot me an email or ask me in class. Lots of balancing practice, so make sure you do it. Get the hang of it.